Hi there, this is session 26 of Programming from the Very Basics using Python. In this session, we'll learn more about defining functions in Python. In, all the, in the last sessions, I talked about uh, the flow control constructs, I talked about various statements in Python, and also introduced you to various built-in types that includes numbers, strings, tuples, list, set, and dictionary. So we will move on forward. I will tell you how to define functions, and once you know this, you will be able to create more reusable Python code. I would have already told you how to define a function in a couple of earlier examples. So you define a function by using the def keyword. Sorry for this, I need to select the kernel. Let me just select this again. Yeah. You define a function using the def keyword followed by the function name. Let's create a very simple function for understanding the function prototypes first. So I'm just going to create a function called square, which is a very simple function, which takes an argument and let's call this argument as x. And now I'm just going to return from this function x into x. Uh, as you can see here, this is how a function um, definition looks like. You can start with you start with the def keyword, you specify the function name, and then you need to have parentheses whereby you can specify what arguments the function takes. And an argument passed on like passed on like this, an argument named this way, is also called as positional argument or positional parameter. So once taken in x, x is merely a variable for now. I can just tell you it's a local variable. I'll talk about the scope of function in the next session. But for now, just note that this particular variable takes in the argument and then it tries to return the result of this expression by using the return statement. Return can only be used inside function definitions. Um, it will not work if you try to use return outside functions. You can just try it out here. We just type, let's say, <clears throat> return 100 throws an error. You can see it's very clear syntax error written outside a function, which means that this written statement is specific to function body. The function body is obviously indented. So if your function is just got a one line body like this, uh, just one statement, you can have it on the same line following the syntax of the compound statement constructs. But it's always suggested that when you define a function, you can, it's recommended that you have them indented in the body this way. Now, to invoke this function, I'll just try to run this in one cell. Let me just keep this cell shorter. And uh, In order to run this, you can just type square. If you call square like this with no arguments, it will throw an error. So you can see that right here. It shows that square missing one required positional argument x, which means that you need to definitely pass an argument in here. So you can pass an argument, let's pass a number like two, and you can see it returns a value four. So this is the outcome of the return statement of the function. Now you might ask me, what if I define a function that does not return anything? Let's create another function here. And let's call this function greet, which takes no arguments. And it just prints a message. from a Python function. <clears throat> so it says greetings from a Python function. Now, okay, I just put a comma here. So maybe the English people will say, oh, okay, you shouldn't be using a hyphen there. Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I just call greet. All right, I didn't run this cell. So when you try to call a function that is not defined as yet, you get this error. If you note, I actually type this function definition in a cell, but I did not execute the cell. So it means the function is not defined. Accessing a name that's not defined will raise this exception, name error. This is pretty much like trying to access a variable that is not defined. You get this error, right? So it shows the error is in this particular line. Let me read on this cell, the first cell, and then now to try to run this cell one more time. <clears throat> so you can see that the Return value of square is not printed because, as you know, that in a, rev, in a in a Jupyter notebook kind of an interface, only the last expression's result is printed in the out. So if you want to get the output of the first one, you might need to maybe you can use print or you can store the written value in a variable and print it. Doesn't matter. So I'll just use print square of two. Now I can also use all function calls as a right hand side expression, like I can do it here. I can just try r is equal to 
this and let me print it here i can just print square returned and i'll just put r here as another parameter for print likewise i'll also do r is equal to greet this time so i'll try to get the written value of greet and try to print it greet returned let me just use the actual function name like this returned and r let me just change this too to make it more consistent When you run this cell this time, you can see the output. Closely observe, square of two returns a value and whatever, return, whatever is returned from this return statement is captured via R. So R will represent the return value of square. After which I'm just trying to print this, it says square returned and the value of R is four. R represents the value four, so just print it. That's a number, right? Uh, when I call greet, the greet function is invoked, which means it executes the function body, which involves printing this output that you see here. But because I did not return anything from greet, the default return value of a function would always be none. So if you don't use any explicit return statements inside a function, if you invoke that function as a right-hand side expression, the default return value would be none. So you can see that greet returned none. So some of you who are new to Python, it's very common that they think that, oh, when I call greet, it has to return that message, greetings from a Python function. Note, the message is printed by the print function on the screen, on the, on the standard output. It's not going to be returned out from a function. If you want to return anything from a function, you have to explicitly use the return statement with an expression. So here I have an expression. So we want this greet to return any value. Maybe I can just say, I can just type return. And I can just type hello. And now we can see that when I execute the cell and execute the cell below, you can see that greet returned hello. Well, you can return just about anything from Python. There's absolutely no limitation on what you can return. This is especially true if you come from C programming language. You know, the functions in C are a little too restrictive. So you can return a primitive variable like say integers <clears throat> or float or so on. But uh, even if you had written a string, it's a little trickier. You get all the kind of complexities, right? The string is allocated on the function stack. Returning a pointer to a string is dangerous because the function exits and everything is thrown down. And now we have a dangling pointer. So all these things matter there, right? Or maybe you allocate memory on heap and do all these things, all this jugglery. This is with C language. Right? It's a low-level language. It's designed to be that way. Everything is low-level. You can see that everything is an object in Python. So when you create hello, hello is an object on heap. So when you're returning anything from a function, what you're returning is a reference to an object. So even when you say return x into x, x into x results to an object called 4. So what is square returning? A reference to that object 4. So function return values are not actual objects. They are references to objects, right? So it doesn't matter what you write. It just works. You can return a number. You can return a string. You can return a, an object of a custom class. You can return a dictionary, anything you want. There's absolutely no restriction here. So that's one of the things you should know. And now the next aspect you should know about the function itself. Functions in Python are treated like just other objects. So functions are called as first class objects. Our first class citizens is what I read in the Python tutorial, perhaps. So they say functions are first class citizen in Python. Well, what do you mean by that? Functions are not treated differently than most other objects which belong to data types. So functions are not treated any different than integers or float or complex and so on, which actually means once you define a function, you can access the function by the name like this, like say greet. Greet is just like another variable. Just like you set A or B or C and you define some variables with some data, right? Like say it could be a number or a list or string. Functions are no different. When you actually access the name of the function, but you don't call it with that open close parenthesis. Just see what it says. This is the string representation of a function object. And only functions are also objects. So I can just put a, make a note here. In Python, 
functions are first class citizen. If you know what why this term first class citizen is used, do let me know in comments. <laughs> right? It's a term used in most of the programming world, but uh, it's got a lot of history. Let me see if anybody's figure, able to figure out why it's called first class citizen. What it actually means is it is functions in Python are treated just like any other objects. So it means functions are objects in Python. But remember, if a function is an object, it has to belong to some type. Right? So what type does it belong? Let's find out. You can do all the things that you normally learn about introspection. So uh, I'll just uh, print, uh, I'll just put this greet at the below. If I just say print, I'll put greet again here and say type, type of greet. When you use ist, when you use str of greet, print internally calls str. str is construct a string from an existing object. Create a string from a known object. What does that string constructor do? I would have told you when I talked about string, right? That every object has a default string representation. For all the objects that belong to data types, the actual data that they represent is shown up as a string. If you try to use str of a number, what do you get? The values of a number as a string. str of a list, it shows up like a list, square brackets with all that values as strings again, separated by comma. We learned that. But because these are data types, they show up their actual values. But then if it's a function, when you try to print it as a string, it says, I'm a function, greet at so-and-so location. This is the address in memory where the function is defined in the current Python implementation, by the way. Yeah, this is the object's ID in, shown up in hexadecimal. We can even confirm that. If you just try to print ID of greet, it shows up in decimal number format. But you can try maybe a hex of ID of greet. I can just see what it does, what it shows. The same number that you see here is the result that you see as hex of ID of greet, right? And because I asked type of greet, what type does this object belong to? It's, it belongs to a class called function. Just like you say class int, class str, class list, class dict. We have classes for all the data types, right? Similarly, even function, there's a class for a function. There's a prototype for a function. I mean, when you say prototype, the template for function objects. And there's just an instance of the class. <clears throat> just that you define a function by using the def keyword, you can't call function open close parenthesis. That's the strange part. So there, there are no, there is no built-in identifier to identify this class. See, it's a little bit of things that you should know about the Python's internal mechanics. So you can just say, see that there's int, float, complex, and uh, str, list, tuple, set, dict, I think I put a few of them, but maybe there are some more like bool, I forgot that, but it doesn't matter. But I print all of them, what do, you, what do you see here? All of these are actually built-in identifiers that point to the classes. Int is an identifier that points to the int class, that represents the int class. Float points to the float class. Complex points to the complex class. But there is no identifier in Python to identify a function class because we don't define a function by calling the function class. It looks very weird. So the way you define a function is using by syntax grammar using the def keyword, right? That's the reason. So you don't see a <clears throat> function as an identifier. If you try looking out for function, name function does not exist, right? But maybe some of you might say this, can I do this? Can I, can I try running this? Can I try to say, function is equal to <clears throat> type of greet. Yeah, you just defined your own identifier by the name function. Yeah, you got a function here. The human asked me, can I call this? Normally when you say int, what does it do? It constructs an integer. Int constructs an integer. By the way, when you say int and if you pass some argument to it, I forgot to mention this. It runs 56, which is the string constructed into an integer. Create new integer from a string. 
56. And again, I reiterate, people call this typecasting. It's a type construction. I'm always reiterating, the, reiterating that, right? You're constructing a new type. Now, object of new type. Can I do the same thing with this function, which I just defined now? Can I call a function like this? Ideally, you should, because all classes can be called like a function. Hmm. It threw a strange error. It said, function missing required argument code. Yes, you can construct a function object manually by calling the function class if you have access to the class, but you need to pass certain arguments. And what is the argument that you need to pass? An argument called code. And what is that code? The representation of the function's body in bytecode format which is very difficult for us to create. We can, but it's a little too involving. You need to take in the source code, compile it. There's a built-in function called compile, by the way, which lets you do that and get a, get a byte code out of it, and then you can pass a code object. So you can do that if you really want to create a function manually, but it's too much involving and not very intuitive. And that's the reason why we have the def keyword in the syntax grammar to make things easy for us. So to define a function, you know, for, def for defining objects of other classes, we use a literal notation, right? like int and float. We learned how to represent them literally. Or you can use the constructor expression. But when it comes to defining a function, you use a def keyword. There's also another way to define a function, which is using the lambda expression, which I will discuss in a while, right? Mostly, I'm not sure if I'll have the time in this session. Mostly, it'll go in part two. Let's find out. <laughs> but fine. So. I told you what a function is. A function is a first class object, which also means that uh, let's consider these two functions. Let's, let's just copy this cell one more time in here. Uh, I try to call a function like this. I right? let it be there. Okay. And this was throwing an error. And uh, let me create a cell below. Uh, oh, maybe I should replace it like this. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I define these two functions all over again. Now I can do this. Square is like a variable. It's no different. All identifiers are like variables in Python. That means you can reassign to them. Am I right? Yes, you can. If you say square, open close parenthesis, or square of two, it shows four. Now I can actually do this. I can say s is equal to square. What did I do here? I am assigning square to S. And what did I talk about assignments? Assignments, copy references. <clears throat> square was a name that was referring to a function. When I assign to S, S now also refers to the same function, which means that now we can call the function either as square, like calling square of two, like I did earlier. No problem. It runs four. Uh, by the way, the last expression, the first expression output will not come up because I didn't print it explicitly. Doesn't matter. You can see this the output is this one, right? Square of two is output, is what you see here. But I can also say, I can also call this function using s of two, and it'll just work fine. So this function has now got an alias. So you can call this function under the name called square or name called s. It just works, right? So you can always assign a function to another variable. Another name, I would say, in this case. Though we're using the word variable, most people con consider variables to represent data. That's a very common, what I say, thought process for most programmers. The moment you say variable, the assumption is that variables represent data. But here, function is not really data. It's code, right? It's code. You call it. You call and get things done. It, it represents an object that represents code. So calling it a name, calling it with the, the function name as a variable might look a little confusing. So we use the generic term called name. That's why in Python, you'll see, you don't say variable error. You won't say function name error. You get name error. When you try to call, you try to access an identifier that is not defined. All identifiers are simply called names in Python. Now, I say s is equal to square, and I'm able to invoke this function under another name without a problem. What if I do this? What if I types square equals greet. Is this a load? Yes, it is, because it's a variable. Variables can always be reassigned. 
Variables are not tied down to any types in Python. And Python is a dynamic language. So all these features of Python lets you do this. So when I say square is equal to greet, now when you try to call square of two, it's not going to work. It's going to throw an error. Oh, it says greet takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. Hmm, interesting. You know, the, you know what happened? When I try to call square here now, it's actually trying to invoke greet. Square just become became an alias to greet. So I can call it like this. Oh, still it says, uh, oh, we shouldn't get that error. Oh, okay. Did I mess it up? No. Oh, okay. I'm trying to call square of two here. You see what I've done here. So I'm rerunning the cell. Squares assigned to greet. This square function is also now greet function. That's why it's doing this error. I'll just split this cell off. I'll just go here and uh, split it. It's another cell now. Try to run this now. By reassigning square to greet, now square becomes greet. So this flexibility is available in Python, but you might ask me, isn't this dangerous? Well, Python gives you a lot of flexibility. You know, anything that's got reasonable power or by giving you a lot of flexibility to do whatever you want with it can be dangerous if you abuse it. That's obvious, like in real world. You know, you say, uh, you know, fire is dangerous. Fire is dangerous. But without fire, our civilization would not have existed like what it is today. From some of the best traits of human civilization is our ability to control fire, right? Control fire. Maybe there were forest fires in the very ancient times, maybe, when human beings were still evolving and uh, most animals might have just run around, hiding around and, you know, trying to avoid fire and they or they become victims. But we humans maybe learned how to control it. And then we realized how to, we learned how to create fire. <laughs> and that gave us immense power. But when used carefully, it gives you power. If, if you need to exercise caution, if you don't exercise caution, it's dangerous. Everything, be it fire, be it weapons and all that, right? The same way, think of all these benefits that Python provides in terms of flexibility is like a powerful weapon. It's up to you whether you want to use it to cut vegetables or, you know, harm yourself. That's the whole point, right? So don't treat this as bad. No, it's not. There are a lot of legitimate use cases of trying to treat function as an object. This makes a concept called functional programming very, very accessible and easy in Python. There are some languages like say Haskell and Lisp where everything is an everything is a function there. Everything is a function there, <laughs> right? So that's that's how they see it as a functional programming languages. So function and data are like treated together at the same in the same same way. So but they are pure functional programming languages. Python, being a very practical language, adopts a lot of the functional programming features if you want to use them. But also leaves, allows you to work the imperative style, right? The imperative programming style, which is trying to treat expressions as normal arithmetic-like expressions and treat data as data and functions as functions. It lets you live in both worlds in the same ecosystem. That's the beauty of it, right? So Square is a reference to greet, and I'm able to call greet here. Now, let me show you something more interesting. Because it's an object, objects have ingredients. They have attributes. Just note this. When I call square here, it's invoking the greet function. But the name of this function, what is the name of this function? You might think it's square now. It is not. Because square is merely a name. It's a variable. It's, a, it's an identifier that's pointing to a function object and that function object has name in it. The function object has a name in it. And what name is it? So you want to find out, if we just try to print what square is as a string, it reveals itself as, I am actually function greet at this location. Not square, greet. How does Python figure out the original name of this function? Well, if we, let's look at it. If I do a DAR, I will tell you what DIR does. DIR will show you the ingredients of an object. We did a DIR of modules, if you remember, when I talked about modules, to see what's inside a module. So in summary, pass on any object and uh, to DIR function, 
it returns a list of attributes of an object, right? You can see that right here. Looks like every single attribute, at least from Python 3 onwards, every single attribute starts with dunder attributes. Time to talk a little bit about the dunder attributes and some things which you can see here. Most of dunder attributes are not for normal workflows and production code. It's like um, these dunder attributes are like you have an object, you have some equipment with a big label stuck on it, authorized service personnel only. Heard about that? <laughs> I've seen this in many of the sophisticated electrical equipment. You try opening it, uh, this equipment must be opened only by or serviced only by authorized service personnel only. I'll tell you that. I'll put a danger sign there. <laughs> That's what these are. But if you know what you're doing, if, you know, if you're really cautious, you can see exactly what they actually reveal. So for example, if you want to find out the name of the function when it was defined, you can always find out by using, um, okay, just go to the next cell, squared art, qual name. It's called, it's short for qualified name during definition. Yeah, it's a string. You can see that. It's a string. It shows it's greet. Can I change it? Apparently you can. You can actually do a squared dot qual name equals squared now. And uh, after that, if you just say print function square, it says I'm square function. I changed the name of the function. It's like that there's a name board on the function body. I just changed it. And now I can actually, though I call it now, it's not going to call square magically. It's still going to call greet. We have not lost the square function completely because we have created a reference to it under the name called S. Remember? S is equal to square. So through S, I can access the original square function. I can do a little bit of uh, what I call as a brain transplant here. Uh, not really useful in production. It's just for fun. I'm just showing you the fun things that you can do in Python with the kind of flexibility that's available. You can try this. You can say square dot code is equal to S dot code. The code attribute, the dunder code attribute, represents the actual byte code of the function. Well, let me just show you what it is. Oh, it shows this code object. This code object itself has a lot of ingredients in it, and one of them I can show you, C underscore code, which is the byte code in bytes format, in binary format, shown up as bytes object here, raw bytes. So it's stored in binary format, in memory, and it's just showing to you as raw bytes. This is the bytecode representation of the function's instructions, which are compiled into the bytecode by Python. You can do this. You can actually change the code object of square with the code object of S. And now when you try to call it, last time when I called square, I was calling the greet function, right? But this time, It throws an error when I try to call square as is. See, it requires an argument now because this code object is different. Pass back an argument, you get back the square function. I don't know if there's any good practical use for this, but uh, these are things that are exposed in Python. Think of Python as a language to a large extent. It is like an engine which is made of glass or any kind of a transparent material. So you can see what's happening inside it. Everything, every single thing right? It's like a very transparent looking engine where when the engine is operating, you can see what's going on inside. All the piston movement and everything can be seen by us. It's not a closed box. It's a very open box. It's very transparent. You can see exactly what's going on inside. And that's exactly what Python is. And this gives you a lot of ways to explore and learn and gather more insight into things happening inside in all the objects. So most objects are open, like an open book this way. Functions that we define are like this, right? So this is like a brain, brain transplant. I have another function, I have another function, two functions. And I took the brain of one function, that's a code, implanted another function. <laughs> now this function works with the brain of another function. That's how it is, right? So that's what I did here. Anyways. Now, after the fun part, let's go to something more interesting, knowing the syntax rules and grammar about function prototypes. And this is the first thing that I talk about. And this is for people who come from C++, Java background, especially C++, Java, maybe PHP, perhaps.
all these languages. And this is where they need to do a little bit of unlearning, unlearning to understand the Python way of doing things. So I'm going to explain what it is. So let me define a function here again. And let's call this function, let's call it greet. And let's say this says, hello user. And if I call greet now, it just prints hello user. Pretty obvious, isn't it? If I try to call greet with an argument, however, hello John, greet of John, that is. Maybe I wanted to print hello John, maybe. I just call greet of John. Do you think it's going to work? Let's try running it. It throws an error. It throws an error. And why is that so? I define greet that takes no arguments. No arguments. Now, I passed an argument to greet. Agreed, right? I passed an argument and uh, the name is John. Now, this throws an error because it says greet takes zero positional argument, but one was given. So I hope that's clear, right? If you define a function that takes in no arguments, you cannot pass any arguments to it when you call it. It's pretty obvious. Now, some of you might, from C++ or Java background, might ask, although where is the polymorphism? How do I do polymorphism? Or people come from JavaScript to say, ah, functions are so strict, they're not variadic. Yeah, language like JavaScript and Perl by default allow functions to be fully variadic. Uh, that's a different story, right? Different languages, different designs when it comes to how they represent functions. This is what it is in Python. Now I'm going to create another function with the same name, read of name. And here I'm just going to say, welcome to Python followed by the name. <clears throat> what do you think would be the result? You have two functions defined under the same name. One function that takes no argument. Again, redefine this function, greet, that takes in an argument. So if I run this, will it throw an error or will it work? If you want to try it out, try it out right now. You can pause the video and try it out. And now, people who come from C or C++, I mean C++, C++ or Java background, if they did them still learning there, they look at it and say, ah, they should work. When you call greet, he should print hello user. Greet of name should print welcome to Python name. So it should work without an error, isn't it? Let's try. Ah, here's an error. And the error is in this line, this line. It says, greet missing one required positional argument name. Huh? Well, let's try to swap these two lines. I've just put this line above like this. I'll try to call greet with an argument now. And then I'll try to call greet with no arguments. Earlier I did the earlier thing first, so it stopped with an error. Now when you try to run this, you still get an error. But you get an error on this line especially. You can see that? Greet with no arguments. Calling greet with no arguments causes an error. Calling greet with an argument, however, passing an argument like John would work. And which function is worked? working? This. What about this function? There's no way you can invoke that function. You know why? This function is lost. It could be, it could have been garbage collected by now. And why is that? Consider this. I type A is equal to 100 like this. I, I'll just show it in the cell. I type A is equal to 100. What does A represent? A value 100. Now I go ahead and say A is equal to hello. What does A represent now? What does A represent now? It's a no-brainer. You will say, ha, hello, right? Hello. And those of you are still in that C of C++ mindset, oh, this is wrong. This is a violation. Uh, you just reassigned a variable in a different type. You'll say like A was an integer. Now you made it a string. That's so wrong. Now. The way you look at variables in Python is different than the way you look at it in other languages, the statically typed languages. Variables are not typed. Whenever you see a variable, remember this sticky note, the tag. Variables are like slapping a tag on any object. Like you have a tag, you have an object, I have a smartphone, and just this is what variables do. I have an object, and this is what these variables do. I stick it on this object. Now this note, this note, and this label, 
represent this object. I can take it out. I can stick it in another object. It's a mouse, obviously. I can. It's the only thing they can find in front of my desk. And I can see that. So this is very flexible. You can stick it on any objects around. Or uh, maybe my monitor, my camera, on my mic, or whatever. Right? It's, that's what this is. Variables are just like this in Python. Keep that in mind. It's not typed. It's not like a label that says, oh, this label should go only on the mouse. And this there's another label to go only on the smartphone. And there's another label that has to go only on the microphone or the screen or whatever. You don't have separate labels. The labels don't have types. Labels are just labels like this. Very simple, very generic. You just make a note here, write, write the name of the label, stick it on any object you want. So this is the kind of the thought process you should have when you know about names or identifiers in Python, right? So there's something which I should tell you. I am a little redundant in repeatingly, repeat, repeating these things all over again, but I'm trying to make sure that people who listen to me have these thought reinforced. That's the only reason I do that. And that works. So I just go around like other videos where I just tell it once and just move on. Uh, people just doze off and they say, oh, did you say that? No, I'm just repeating most of the things. So reason to make sure your thought process is reinforced with these important idioms in Python. All right. I told you that when you say A is equal to 100, followed by A is equal to hello, when you print A, the last definition clobbers the previous definition. We call this clobbering. Some people call this namespace clobbering, right? So the last definition, basically A was representing 100. When I took that label off from 100, you slap it on hello. Now the label A represents hello. What about 100? Very likely it could be garbage collected. Assuming there are no other references. Assuming there are no other references to 100, it could be garbage collected. And that's what happens. You no longer refer to 100 anymore. That's it. A no longer refers to 100. The same happens when you define functions with the same name twice. With It can be same prototype or different prototype. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you may say, what if I call greet with no arguments? Still the same. Still the same. No difference at all. If you call greet like this and uh, remove this name in here, this time when you call greet of John is not going to work, obviously, because greet no longer takes an argument. Both prototypes don't take an argument. But when you call greet, both the times, it's just going to call welcome to Python. The function that was printing hello user is no longer accessible by any means because the only identifier that was created to represent this function object at this moment was greet. When I said def greet, it reused that identifier to point to a new function object which had this body. So therefore, whenever you try to access greet, it's going to be this function object. This function object has no other references. In all likelihood, this would be garbage collected. Greet. Python just disposes it off from memory, right? That's what you should know. But when you have a function with different prototypes like this, it doesn't work like other languages. I told you unlearning for C++ and Java because they have they have they are accustomed to do this. Um, creating a function, especially in Java, it's done very very frequently. You define a function or a method rather methods because you don't have functions in Java. You have methods instead of functions. You define the same method with the same name, about ten or fifteen definitions. One of them has one argument, another one has another argument, another one has a different typed argument, and they call that polymorphism. The term polymorphism is an object-oriented term. What exactly is polymorphism? Uh, especially when you look at method polymorphism or function polymorphism, the ability of a function to work differently or make take different actions based on the kind of arguments or the number of arguments that you pass. There are a lot of specifications like arity-based polymorphism, type-based polymorphism, and all that mess. That's the statically type world. So ultimately, polymorphism is all about a function that can act accordingly based on different arguments. The arguments could be of different types. The arguments could be of different numbers, different number of arguments. So that's what differentiates arity-based or type-based polymorphism. Well, the whole definition of polymorphism, when I read it, it says a function, a function 
that has to act differently based on different arguments, am I right? But what you end up doing in C++ and Java is that you don't create a function, you create many functions with the same name and fool the user telling that, oh, there's only one function called greet, but when the user calls greet with no arguments, it is wired to one internal function that does something else. But when the same user calls greet with one argument, you're wiring it to another function internally. We call them as method wiring, and all that stuff. We call them binding, right? They call them like, you know, runner, they call them compile time binding and uh, stuff like that. Python treats polymorphism the way it is defined. It is the ability of a function to act differently based on different arguments. That'll be just talk about the arity based polymorphism first. Now let's talk about that. Let us say I want to call this greet function with an argument or with no arguments and it has to work accordingly. Maybe when I call greet with no arguments, it has to just print a message called hello user. But if I pass a parameter like say John, one argument, it has to just print welcome to Python, John. So how do I do that? You don't define two functions like these. That's not the right way to do it in Python because obviously the last function definition will clobber up the previous definitions. We saw that already. But the way you do that is by using a syntax grammar where you type def greet of name equals none this time. This is a more practical or a most widely used um, use case for none. You can ask me where is, where is none used? The most common use case of none is in function prototypes to say that this variable by default is none. That's an arity variable or a parametric variable or positional argument you might call it. You're setting it to none by default. These are also called as default arguments. Defining functions with default arguments. Now here, if at all I try to call this function, I'll just do one thing. I'll just uh, create a logic here. I'll add a logic. I'll say if name is none. Now someone might ask, uh, why am I checking specifically for none? Why not say if not name? I could do that. But if not name will be valid if name is equal to zero or name is equal to empty string. If you want that as an action, if you want to, if you want to work with that design, you could use the idiom as if not name. But I'm, if I want to check specifically whether a variable variable represents none, whether name is really none and nothing else, not zero, not empty string and so on, this specific check is what is required. And yes, I'm not using double equal so operator because none is a singleton object. Whenever you're trying to compare against a singleton object, it is a common practice to use the is operator and not the double equals to operator. What are singleton objects? Objects that don't have more than one copies or one instances of themselves. There's just one instance of none in the entire Python's memory. You can't have two copies of none in memory ever. You could have multiple copies of some numbers like say 1000, 2000 strings and all that. We can have multiple copies and living in different addresses. The IDs will be different. No matter how many times you define none, all of their IDs will be the same. That means they point to the same object. That's what makes none a single term. None, true, false, all the small numbers between minus five to plus two to five, they're all single terms. Just so that you note, right? And now I'm just gonna say, if name is none, I can just type print, hello world, hello user perhaps. Else, I could just print, welcome to Python, followed by name here. The name that's passed on as an argument is a variable here that I can use. Now this will make it work. You can see this, oh, no errors. And it and it takes two different paths. So if at all I try to call greet with no arguments, it prints hello user. Greet with an argument, it prints welcome to Python, John. This is an example of an arity based polymorphism. Now some people I've seen in my trainings when I talk about this and show this as polymorphism, the Java gurus who sometimes attend the training will, will uh, debate and they say, oh, this design is not, this is too rigid. You might have two different logic. 
for the function, like your function, which has a different logic when you pass an argument and a totally different logic when you don't pass an argument, but you're putting all of them in one place and your function becomes bloated. But in our design, we are creating two separate functions for doing it. Well, the answer to that is, if you're designing a function to be called with the same name, you're gonna call it greet. You don't expect two different logic in that function. You should think on the design. You should think deeper on the design. If at all you have two different logic, completely different logic in the function's implementation, based on an argument and based on no argument, they don't deserve to be called as a polymorphic function. Rather, you should rather rename them as two different functions. That makes it more obvious to the user. So the user knows that, oh, this function, like, well, this will have a different logic of implementation. Let's call it something else. Maybe I should call it as welcome for one function and uh, hello for another function. So the function name, instead of calling as greet, should be called welcome and hello. That's how my argument would be. Polymorphism is not about trying to make a function to two different things based on the arguments or two or more different things based on the arguments. It's about doing things differently. You might think of what am I saying here? I mean, there's a lot of difference between telling doing two different things versus doing the same thing differently, <laughs> right? For example, I want to square a number or to square a number. The actual act of what I'm doing is squaring numbers, right? But maybe the argument I pass is a single number I want to square the number. If I pass two numbers, I want to square both these numbers. The real, trick, the real thing is square. But based on whether I want to square one number or two number, the logic of square is going to be the same. Just that you apply for one or you apply for many. The core engine, the core logic for squaring is not going to change, but it's all about deciding whether should I apply for one number or more number. So this is doing the same thing differently for different arguments. And that's what polymorphism is supposed to be intended. You shouldn't think of a function that is completely different in its logical way of doing things when you pass an argument and does completely different things when you don't pass an argument. So that is a bad design. You should not create a function with the same name in the first place. There are, there are, there are two separate functions with two different activities altogether. And that, that's not, that's, you don't mix that with polymorphism. So when you're calling a function, a user is expected to know what this does. Print. One argument, it prints. Two arguments, it prints. You pass a string, it prints. You pass a number, it prints. The print function, which is built-in, is a truly polymorphic function. Am I right? You can pass any argument to it. You can pass a number, you can pass a string, you can pass a list, you can pass a function name. It prints everything. What does it do? It prints. How does it print it? Might vary. But the real act is printing it. The logic for printing a function or a logic for printing a number is not too different. It's just going to call str of that function. str of that function. The str takes care of abstracting how the string representation is. And that's, how, that's what makes it work. So when you think of polymorphism, it's not just polymorphism that we taken separately. It does deal with other objects sometimes to get things done. And that's where you don't want to put all the logic of manip manipulating the object in your code. You must abstract it with some layer of abstraction. That way this code, which is supposed to be polymorphic, is generic as possible. Yeah, that requires a lot of thought process in redesigning, refactoring your code, right? Yes, I'm not gonna say that the way polymorphism is done in static grid language is bad. It's the limitation of a language design due to its static nature. I guess it could be fixed. C++ does have this feature. It's not unique to Python. People have come to C++ and say, ah, we know this. We've been doing this for ages, <laughs> right? I guess Java has introduced some amount of flexibility in its polymorphism in the recent times. I realized they used uh, the triple dot ellipsis operator for variadic uh, functions, which was not possible in Java till Java 5. So things like that. It's improving. As the language grammar improves, they all converge to what Python is today. I would say, right? Anyways. Now coming to the great function here, 
This is an example of a polymorphic function which does what we call as an arity-based polymorphism. But there's another thing I should talk about is a type-based polymorphism where let's say I use depth square of x and I'll just put it an x into x. And keeping all the function body simple so you understand the function prototypes and how it works. That's the focus of this particular session. I don't want to put like complex code here, but once you understand how function call works, how you can pass arguments and all that, writing complex code inside function, you will know exactly what each of these code bits do, right? So I'm creating, I'm creating a function called square, which takes an argument, returns the square of an argument here again, as we've been using it from the first cell in the session. Um, when I try to call print square of two, what I'm passing, an integer, square of 4.5, what I'm passing, a floating point, square of, I hate this, pop-ups, sadly I delivered it, this is VS code for you, ah, okay, square of true, for instance, you can see that I'm passing different kinds of numbers in here. I pass an integer, I pass a float, I pass the complex number, I pass the boolean, and it all just works fine. This is polymorphic, isn't it? In order to achieve something like this in many languages, use these so-called templates. You know, T square of TX, C++ folks. I think now templates have made its way into Java too, I heard. They were generics earlier, but I think now there are templates also, I heard. So, yeah, all these things, new language adopted. This whole thing is all, they, all these are the tenets of uh, object-oriented programming, they say. And uh, when you look at object-oriented programming, the very early ancient object-oriented programming languages, Simula, Modula, but all of them are mostly dynamic languages, small talk. These were dynamic languages. So object-oriented programming as a design originated with dynamic programming languages. They may not be fully dynamic, but they are like semi-dynamic. They are the early generation, obviously. So if you look at Python being a fully dynamic programming language, allows adding all the object-oriented principles without much of a problem. But it's only when you have something like C++, Objective-C, or Java, and all these languages try to introduce object-oriented programming into the statically typed world. And they introduce a lot of new jargons and a lot of new ways to overcome the limitations of the static design, right, of the language. And that's where you see a lot of differences between how they do things and how we do things in the Python world. So if you want to do type-based polymorphism, this is it. But there's a problem. There is a problem. What if I call print square of, I'm going to use another line here. Hello. Whoopsie. It throws an error. It throws an error. You can see that square of 2, it works. Square of 2, 4.5, so this uh, complex number, all these. This, this, this line is not a problem. This statement gave you some output. But this particular statement raised an exception. You can see that raised an error. Print square of hello. It raised an error with this line. It tried to multiply hello with hello. It threw an error. So I think, ah, oh, this is a problem. This is not a problem, my friend. This is a feature. And this is where I want to introduce you to a concept called duct typing. Or is it time to introduce duct typing? I think it's for the next session. <laughs> next session. So, but now I tell you that this is not a really an error. But if you really don't want this, what I would talk about is you can fix this by maybe checking the type. You can just say if type of x in, you can see the EDM I'm using here. Type of x is in int float bool or complex. Then you return x into x. Or maybe you pass a string hello. Maybe you want to return nothing. Or maybe you want to just say return the string or maybe the x or I can just use more another specific type obviously it'll not work for everything if type of x in string bytes 
byte array and tuple list. All of these are sequence type that we know about. We can just say it on x into 2. Repeat it twice. Right? You have a solution, which means that you could, in your code, identify what type of argument is being passed. If the argument that you pass belongs to the types, which is int, float, bool, or complex, that's what an in operator does. Type of x returns the type of an object that you pass as an argument. When you pass 2, type of x will be int. When you pass 4.5, type of x is float. So it's going to check whether it's any one of these types. Note the expression I'm using here, the in operator, magical, right? If element in iterable or collection in this case, right, for item in tuple, then you return the number multiplied by itself. Elif, otherwise, if the type is in string, bytes, byte array, tuple, list, all of these make up sequences, built in data type that's, we call them as sequences. I forgot range here, and range is a mystery. I'll talk about that later. Then you say, return x into two. So this would work for a string. You can also pass a list. Or you can also pass a tuple. You can see that list is repeated twice, tuple is repeated twice. That's what it does. Maybe you want to say, no, 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 if it's a list or a tuple, I want to take all the numbers, square all these numbers. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> you just need to add some more conditions here. So you can dynamically check for types of an object passed to a function and act accordingly. You can do that. But the point is that you should, if you have completely different logic, then it's better not to mix them in a single function, create two different functions. And tell the user, you want to square, use this. You want to do something else, use that other function. That's what you should decide on your design, right? So there's something you should know. And uh, is this a good design? I would not prefer this. Though this works, I, I say I would not personally recommend this. This design. From the design part of things, this introduces rigidity. Rigidity. Tomorrow, if there's a new numeric type that you just got to know, it's available in a module. Let's say there's a module called decimal module, which provides uh, a class called decimal, which gives you arbitrary floating point. That won't work with this because I'm not checking for that. Fractions module has a class called fraction, which lets you represent fractional numbers, one by two, three by four, right? All the rational numbers, and that won't work in here. So if you come out of your own custom numeric type, maybe you create a, fun, create a number like say, positive integer, that won't work with this. So there are limitations. That means you need to check for every single type of integer that can come up in the future. So this is rigid. This is not something that's scalable. Sequences, obviously I did not check for range here. There are, another, there are a couple of sequences found inside the collections module. You can't check for them here. So you want to make this code more generic. In the next session, I'll introduce you to an interesting concept. It's called generalization. That is how it is done in the traditional programming world. And then I'll tell you how it is done the Python way. We call it as duct typing. I already have made a video about that, but that's for, it's a quick. I guess a short video, but it'll be a longer form of that same video I'll be making the next session. And uh, this will give you some of the features of the function, all the things that you know about Python functions. Slowly as you progress along, I'll tell you about formal prototypes of function. When I talk about, I just told you about how to call a function with one argument or no argument. I told you about default arguments as one of the prototype features, the syntax grammar features of function. I will cover much later, maybe the third session third part of the series, right? Uh, this is first part of the series, so not mostly the third part. I will tell you about all the formal function prototype features that you know about and use cases for functions, right? Different ways you can use them. So I will conclude the series here. So I think uh, um, this, in summary, in this particular session, you learned what functions are in Python, how to define a function in the very basic form, and I, or you would also know that functions are treated like first class objects and I showed you with demonstration how they are. And I also told you how to call a function and uh, what happens when you define a function with the same name multiple times, the act of 
last definition clobbering up all the previous definitions we saw that in saw that in place here and i told you how to create a function with a very basic form where you can implement basic polymorphism where have a function with no argument have a function with one argument calling a function with one or zero arguments in the further sessions i will tell you about different ways you can implement function prototypes right so i hope you found this video useful if you do like this video if you do think that i'm adding value to value by information to you uh do hit on the like button so i appreciate that and uh, if you're not subscribed to my channel you can subscribe to my channel to watch more further videos which i make like this thank you very much so meet you on the next part